With the critical and financial success of The Simpsons throughout the 90s, it wasn't long before numerous other animated shows specifically made for adults went into production, with varying degrees of success. One such show was The Critic, about the life of film reviewer Jay Sherman. On paper, The Critic seemed like it would have made for the perfect show to springboard off the success of The Simpsons. However, ultimately, The Critic only aired from January 1994 to May 1995, consisting of 23 episodes over two seasons, followed by an additional 10 webisodes between 2000 and 2001. The Critic was created by Simpsons writers L. Jean and Mike Reese, who had been the showrunners for The Simpsons over the third and fourth seasons between September 1991 and May 1993. Additionally, The Critic was executive produced by Simpsons co-developer James L. Brooks and starred John Lovitz, who had previously worked on The Simpsons a number of times as the titular character for the series, Sherman. So, understandably, given the links between the two shows, it made perfect sense that when The Simpsons inevitably did a crossover with another show, the series in question would be The Critic. However, although the episode was relatively well received by fans and critics, it was controversial for a number of reasons, most notably for the outrage it generated from The Simpsons creator Matt Groening, and the lingering bitterness it created between the two shows that was understandable, but also pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Given the links between The Simpsons and The Critic, it wasn't long before there was talk of using the success of the series to promote another animated show with a crossover episode. The result was A Star is Burns, the 18th episode of the sixth season of The Simpsons, which first aired in March 1995. After Springfield decides to hold a film festival, they invite Sherman to be a judge. The episode was directed by Susie Dieter. It was their third episode for the series, having previously directed the critically acclaimed episodes Bart Gets Famous, the 12th episode of the fifth season, when Bart gets known as the I Didn't Do It Boy. Say the line, Bart! I didn't do it. Yeah! And the episode Bart's Girlfriend, the seventh episode of the sixth season, when Bart falls for Reverend Lovejoy's daughter. The script for A Star is Burns was written by Ken Keeler, which was his first for The Simpsons. Despite being controversial, A Star is Burns is far from the most notorious episode he'd write for the show, as he'd later write the second episode of the ninth season, The Principal and the Pauper, when Principal Skinner is revealed to be an imposter, which most fans didn't appreciate though it isn't completely without merit. Ultimately, A Star is Burns received mixed reviews from critics, many of whom felt the crossover was out of place on The Simpsons. Conversely, Barney's film festival entry, entitled Pocahontas, about his alcoholism, which referenced a 1982 experimental film, was well received by fans. At the time, the idea of a crossover made sense, business-wise, especially for someone like Brooks, who was an industry veteran, responsible for co-creating a number of iconic TV shows, including The Mary Tyler Moore Show, about an unmarried, independent woman who's focused on a career as a TV producer, which ran from September 1970 to March 1977, consisting of 168 episodes over seven seasons, and the series Taxi, about the lives of a group of taxi drivers, which ran from September 1978 to May 1982, made up of 114 episodes over five seasons. So, as far as Brooks was concerned, using a popular series to promote another show was just how the industry worked. And, honestly, the critic needed the help. The series was first broadcast on ABC in January 1994. Although the show was well received by critics, it failed to find a significant audience, resulting in the series being put on hiatus for six weeks. The final episodes of the first season aired from June 1994 onwards, though failed to build much more of a fan base. For the second season, Brooks got the series moved to the Fox network, who put it on right after The Simpsons, with the first episode of The Critic premiering on Fox immediately after A Star is Burns aired. Given the critic's relationship to The Simpsons and its time slot, Brooks was the one who pushed for the crossover, suggesting that having a film festival would serve as the perfect way to introduce a series to Fox viewers. And the plan was perfect, in theory. In theory, communism works. However, Brooks hadn't anticipated Green's reaction to both the episode and the very idea of crossovers. Get out of my office! Ironically, given Green's feelings about the critic, he was actually kind of responsible for its creation, even if only indirectly. During Gene and Reese's time as The Simpsons showrunners, Groening approached the pair to develop a spin-off for The Simpsons, revolving around the show's secondary character, Krusty the Clown. Gene and Reese envisioned Krusty moving to New York, with his professional life revolving around the struggles of being a public figure, and working with eccentric workmates while raising a child on his own. Ultimately, Groening turned down Gene and Reese's pitch, 
and, instead, wrote a pilot script for the proposed series himself, which he originally wanted to be a live-action show, starring the voice actor behind Krusty in the main role, Dan Castellaneta. An idea that sounds terrible, but actually could have worked. Later, in 1993, Brooks approached Gene and Reese with the idea of a live-action sitcom based on a morning television program, for which the pair adapted their crusty pitch to the new premise, creating the new character of Sherman as the star of the show. From the start, Brooks wanted Lovitz as the lead. Based on his minor, though standout performance in the 1992 film A League of Their Own, a fictionalized account of the real-life All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. In the film, Lovitz plays a flawed but charismatic scout with a strange pathetic charm. Oh, doesn't that hurt them? Doesn't seem to. That was the hell out of me. Lovitz was interested in the role of Sherman, though he initially had to turn it down due to commitments with a number of upcoming films. In response, it was agreed that the show should be animated in order to make the production and scheduling easier. Once the decision was made to make the series animated, Gene and Reese set about doing everything they could to distance their show from The Simpsons, as they were well aware that there would be comparisons and that Groening wouldn't be happy about that. For A Star Is Burns, Sherman's appearance was altered to make him fit with The Simpsons' distinct aesthetic. Specifically, his skin color was made yellow and he was given an overbite, matching with Groening's unique illustration style. However, when it first came to designing Sherman and the other characters along with the very world of the critic, the team behind the show went to great effort to create their own style, as far removed from The Simpsons as was possible, in order to avoid any confusion about its relationship with the show and Groening, to truly make the show their own. There were three key people responsible for designing the critic's distinct look, David Silverman, Rich Moore, David Cutler, and Everett Peck. Two of those people had played significant roles in making The Simpsons the iconic series it became, and they were determined to produce something very different from their previous work. There was Silverman, who had animated and directed The Simpsons, dating back to the series' time on The Tracy Ullman Show between 1987 and 1989. Silverman had also directed numerous Simpson episodes, including the pilot for the series, Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire. The other person from the Simpsons team was Moore, who directed a number of critically acclaimed episodes for the series, including Lisa's Substitute, in which Lisa develops a crush on her substitute teacher, flaming Moe's, when Moe claims a drink that Homer invented as his own, and Stark raving Dad, that sees Homer locked up at a mental hospital. I can't wear a pink shirt to work. Everybody wears white shirts. I'm not popular enough to be different. For the critics, Silverman produced the basic look of Sherman after producing a quick sketch on a napkin while at a restaurant. Warren Cutler designed the general look of the series, including some of the backgrounds and supporting cast, while the character of Doris was based on one of Peck's drawings. That wasn't very sexy, was it? Cutler also played a major role in standardizing all the different animation styles, while Moore was responsible for most of the framing throughout the series. The design team never intended to make the characters of the critic too cartoony, as they felt that it wouldn't fit tonally with the type of show it was. With the objective of distancing the show's aesthetic from The Simpsons, as much as possible, characters of the show were designed via a general think tank process, whereby rough sketches were designed and discussed during meetings involving the full creative team. Although most of the character designs of the critics succeeded in distancing the show's look from The Simpsons, Sherman proved to be a challenge when it came to both differentiating him from Graining's show and his general appearance. Ultimately, Sherman's design would change somewhat over the course of the critics' run. Early on, Moore had expressed reservations about the character's design, specifically his flat head and tiny eyes, that were difficult to work with, particularly in a 3D space. Originally, it was decided that Sherman's initial design perfectly encapsulated his distinct personality, so it was left unchanged, despite Moore's concerns. However, over the course of its two seasons, the design was altered slightly to make it easier to animate, with Sherman's head made more round and his eyes made larger. At its core, the critics shared the same sense of humor as The Simpsons, though Gene and Reese were willing to take much bigger risks than they had previously done on The Simpsons, with darker jokes and social commentary, the likes of which wouldn't be seen until the arrival of shows like South Park and Family Guy. First I need a topic. Chaplin, Polanski, and Woody. Three men and a little lady. Ah! Perhaps one characteristic that differentiated the critic from The Simpsons was his objective to satirize or at least parody the film industry. The Simpsons has always had a number of film references. However, more often than not, especially in the early seasons, the references were homages. Now here's a film that will turn you into a vicious, soulless killer. Enjoy! Conversely, while the critic paid respect to its influences, much of the humor was directed at the absurdity of the film and television industry, and how money and popularity is often prioritized over artistic merit. 
No, your job is to rate movies on a scale from good to excellent. What if I don't like them? That's what good's for. The show was well received by real life critics, some of who actually appeared on the show as themselves. Additionally, the critic holds the unusual distinction of being the only television series, animated or otherwise, the legendary film reviewers Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert reviewed on their iconic TV series Siskel and Ebert. I like the concept, it's all animated from the same production company that gave us The Simpsons. Unfortunately, it doesn't have as many memorable characters as that series. If the critic is going to succeed, and I hope it does, it desperately needs to refocus itself on the movies and the way critics interact with them. The very best thing in the show so far has been the satires yes. of movies, and they yes. ought to have two or three of those in every show, Absolutely. current movies or kinds of movies. And also, yes. I'd like to see Jay Sherman watch television so that he could satirize and discuss uh, what's on television these days. Also, I think they ought to keep Jay Sherman as a smart critic because then they'll, their targets will be you much know, sharper. I actually think that Jay Sherman is much smarter than I expected him to be before I saw the show. Much like their time as a showrunner for The Simpsons, when it came to choosing things to parody, Gene and Reese made the conscious decision to find the right balance between current pop culture references that would stand the test of time. Oh, Mr. Wilson! What do you want? That kid is a pain in the ass! Despite their efforts, though, there were still a number of similarities between The Critic and The Simpsons. Basically, the critic took the pop culture parodies that made up a significant portion of The Simpsons, especially during Gene and Reese's time as showrunners, and built a new series around them. And, ironically, this made the critic the closest thing to a spin-off series that The Simpsons ever got, despite how Graining felt about it. As predicted, Graining wasn't happy with the proposed crossover, feeling that it was just a tacky 30-minute advert for the critic. Furthermore, despite Gene and Reese's legitimate efforts to distance their show from The Simpsons, Graining was concerned that people wouldn't correctly associate the show with him as a direct spin-off of The Simpsons. Initially, Graining kept his concerns behind closed doors. However, he would eventually go public with these issues with The Star is Burns, before having his name removed from the episode's credits, so he didn't receive the typical created by and developed by credits that air at the end of the opening sequence. Although Brooks appreciated Groening's issues with the crossover, Brooks was furious with how Groening conducted himself in relation to the controversy, specifically that Groening went public with his complaints. Honestly, both Groening and Brooks had legitimate points. At the time that Groening publicly voiced his concerns, he had already been listed as the creator of The Critic in a number of news reports, despite having absolutely nothing to do with the show. Additionally, Groening was also correct that a crossover was a fundamentally cheap and tacky piece of self-promotion, the likes of which were so shameless that they were beneath The Simpsons, at least at the time. Conversely, Brooks felt that Groening was being hypocritical by refusing to help Gene and Reese after all the hard work they contributed to The Simpsons that Groening, as the creator of the series, got credit for, particularly during their time as the series' showrunners. Since the episode first aired, Groening's feelings towards the star's burns don't seem to have changed all that much. Given that he was absent for the episode's commentary for the complete sixth season DVD box set released in August 2005. Although the feud between The Simpsons and The Critic was, ultimately, just between Brooks and Graining, a number of other people were caught in the crossfire. There was, of course, Lovett, who had, until that point, had a good relationship with The Simpsons, having previously guest starred in a number of episodes of the series, most notably as Artie Ziff, Marge's ex-boyfriend, who first appeared in the 12th episode of the second season, The Way We Was, when Homer and Marge recount how they met. Hey, would you like to go? Oh, she's mine! Additionally, the voice actor behind Bart Simpson, Nancy Cartwright, was heavily involved in The Critic, voicing numerous characters over the course of its original run, most notably as the voice of Sherman's sister, Margot. However, the two most innocent people caught up in the drama were the creators of The Critic, Gene and Reese. Having proven their talents and paid their dues while running The Simpsons, the crossover was supposed to be their moment of triumph, with their return to the show where the success all began. Gene and Reese had left The Simpsons after the end of the fourth season in 1993, so, now, David Merkin was the showrunner for The Simpsons when the concept for A Star Wars Burns was pitched. 
However, in a highly unusual move, Gene and Reese return to serve in the role of showrunners for the episode, given their past experience in the position and the relevance of the story. Ultimately, although the controversy of the episode sullied what should have been a momentous occasion for Brooks, Gene, Reese, Lovett, and Cartwright, all involved would go on and have good working relationships in the future. A Starry's Burns had a number of classic Simpsons jokes and moments that would become iconic. Are you saying boo or Burns? I was saying Burns. Still, the very nature of the episode as an inherently shameless promotion sullied the episode for many fans who didn't stick around to give the critic a chance when it premiered on Fox. With the time slot that followed The Simpsons, viewership for the critic did improve, though Fox still chose to move the show after five episodes before cancelling it after the second season had aired. At the time, there was, reportedly, nine scripts already written for the third season. The show would later return for a third season of sorts in the form of three to five minute webisodes from 2000 to 2001 consisting of 10 installments. Jay, you bitch. It's the internet. I can say bitch. Ultimately, although the critic was short-lived, the show has since found a cult following. Additionally, despite the controversy surrounding A Star is Burns, Sherman became an infrequently reoccurring character on The Simpsons, appearing in speaking roles in the eighth episode of the eighth season, Hurricane Nettie, when Flanders has a nervous breakdown. It stinks. It stinks. Yes, Mr. Sherman, everything stinks. Sherman also appeared in the 14th episode of the 15th season, The Ziff Who Came to Dinner, when Lovett's other character, Ziff, takes residence in The Simpsons' attic. I'd like you to meet Artie Ziff. Hello, handsome. Hello, losers. Although there were plenty of shows that tried to shamelessly capitalize off the popularity of The Simpsons, the critics shouldn't be considered one of them. It's true that A Star is Burns was opportunistic, but the resulting crossover is still a solid episode of the golden era of The Simpsons and came about after years of hard work that Gene and Reese had put into the show, playing a significant role in making The Simpsons the iconic series that it became. Groening wasn't necessarily wrong to criticize The Simpsons critic crossover, but Brooks was also right to call Groening out for going public with his concerns, which sullied what should have been Gene and Reese's crowning moment after they created a truly unique show that should have lasted much longer than it did, and maybe would have had it gotten more support. Fortunately, the critic has since become a cult classic due to the high quality of writing, humor, and creativity that, even to this day, sets it apart from most other TV series, a fact that, in retrospect, underscores how ridiculous the controversy over the episode of Stars Burns truly was. That's what good's for.